Hey, you're running through a vast field at night, as if something is chasing you right now. The light of the full moon brightens your path, and you see a circle of light around it. You run on looking for a safe shelter. It's not about werewolves, who are said to appear when the moon is full. Soon, this place will be the epicenter of a major storm. This very circle around the moon is called a halo, and ice crystals cause it in the sky. When the moon is full, it reflects a lot of sunlight. These rays then pass to the Earth's surface, but they curve their trajectory and split as they pass through hexagonal ice crystals. As a result, we have a halo of different colors, almost like a rainbow. The inner edge of the halo is red, and the outer edge is blue. It looks beautiful, but the presence of ice in the clouds means this ice will soon turn into water and begin to fall to the ground. And this rain will be so heavy that you'd better find a shelter beforehand. If the weather is quite warm and the clouds are closer to the ground, you might see a similar phenomenon, a corona. It's much smaller than a halo, but much more colorful. The bluish-white disk on the inside turns brownish-red on the outside. Unlike Halo, the corona is made of water droplets. The smaller these drops are, the larger the corona will be. If the water droplets are large, the corona will look like a bright spot the size of the moon itself. Both the corona and Halo might also occur during the day when the sun is shining. But be sure to wear sunglasses before just glancing at it, because it's very bright and really bad for your eyes. As soon as you find a shelter, it starts raining heavily. Whoa, what is that? Are you being photographed? No, the flash you just saw is lightning. Bam! Thunder is so strong, the windows in the house start to shake. Here's a tip on how to tell if you're far away from the epicenter of a thunderstorm. When you see lightning, start counting. 1 1,000, 2 1,000, 3, and so on. When you hear the thunder, stop counting. Now you have to divide that number by 5. If you can count to 5, it means the epicenter of the thunderstorm is 1 mile away. If you didn't find a shelter before the thunderstorm started and it caught you in the open, leave the high ground immediately. Any mountain or hill is a high-risk area. Don't even think about hiding under a tree. Tall objects are the first target for lightning. Power poles are also at risk. If a thunderstorm catches you riding a bike, drop it immediately and run away. Same if you were riding in a convertible, golf cart, or motorcycle. If a thunderstorm started while you were in an open field, the tallest object here is you. Get down and try to cover yourself somehow. If you're not alone, try to keep your distance from each other. Whew! Now, let's admire the beautiful sunrise. It looks like someone spilled red paint on the sky. This beautiful view means it's about to start raining. You can see a red sky at sunrise because the high-pressure zone has just passed you by and is now followed by a low-pressure zone with high water content in the air. So, take an umbrella with you or go back to a warm bed and stay indoors. There's an old saying to keep it all straight. Red sky in the morning, sailor take warning. Red sky at night, sailor's delight. Sometimes you can even predict rain by smelling it. It's all about ozone molecules. Storm currents bring ozone down from the upper atmosphere. And when the storm is about to start, you can smell a sense of cleanliness. It's like you just washed the floor with clean water. Your sense of smell gets more sensitive before it starts to rain. It's not because of your nose, but because of the more humid air. Flowers spray their scent, and the water molecules stick to it, spreading it much better. That's why the same flowers smell different when you smell them outside or in a closed, humid greenhouse. Plants can also help you predict changes in weather. If you touch the grass in the morning and it's wet, it means it's going to be a clear day. That morning water on the grass is dew. It appears at the coldest time of night. Clear skies allow the Earth to cool a bit, and the water vapor molecules in the air turn into a liquid that settles on various surfaces. Take a closer look at the leaves on the trees. Sometimes they can be upside down. For example, maple leaves respond well to increased humidity before the rain. Their stems become very soft, and the wind can turn them upside down. But the best indicator is pine cones. The seeds are inside the cone, just under its scales. The pine needs to keep them as dry as possible so that the wind can carry the seeds far away and new trees can emerge from them. So when the pine senses rain approaching, it gives the order to close the cones. Then the scales close, protecting the seeds from the water. And instead of boring weather forecast hosts, you can just follow the animals and insects. Have you heard the crickets chirp? That will be your thermometer for today. 
Set the timer for 15 seconds and count how many times crickets chirp. Add 37 to that number, and you get the outdoor temperature value in Fahrenheit degrees. All because air temperature directly affects crickets' metabolism. It can chirp slower and faster depending on how warm it is. So throw away your thermometer and get yourself a little friend. Now, if you don't like insects, look up into the sky for birds. If they're flying high, it'll be a clear and sunny day. But before it rains, air pressure prevents birds from flying high. You may see them flying in flocks very low, most likely looking for shelter. So even if the sky is clear, air pressure tells you that rain is coming. If you live near a river or lake, you can hear toads singing, although you can't quite make out the lyrics because it's in toad. They are especially loud before it rains hard. Toads, in general, love wet weather, so they just get excited. Rain is also the best time for females to lay eggs, so they scream loudly in search of a guy to wed. Ow! A mosquito has just bitten you. If mosquitoes are being especially aggressive, you better find a shelter fast. The insects are just trying to eat more before they have to starve during the storm. Also, the warm, humid air makes us sweat more, and we become even more attractive to mosquitoes. Insects also gather in swarms before a thunderstorm. They love the moisture in the air and start circling in a dance. But then they vanish into thin air. It means you have one hour left before heavy rain starts. To predict the weather for the next day, you need to watch the bees. If it rains tomorrow, the bees work overtime. They're pollinating flowers actively because they know they won't be able to leave the hive the next day because of the rain. Squirrels can predict the weather for the whole season. They usually stock up on food for the cold times. And if they start doing it early, it's going to be a tough winter. You can see squirrels running around looking for acorns. They hide them in the ground and run to find the next one. The squirrels often forget where they hid the food. These acorns turn into little sprouts, so we have many new trees, all thanks to squirrels. Animals can also predict disasters like earthquakes. Scientists once did a study in an area with frequent earthquakes in Europe. They put trackers on cows, dogs, and sheep. About 18,000 earthquakes occurred there during that time. Most of them were insignificant, but there were also 12 with a magnitude of 4 on the Richter scale. And each time, before the earthquakes, researchers recorded strange animal behavior. It was as if they were trying to escape from the earthquake zone. Scientists believe animals can sense the ionization of the air before a disaster with their fur. Their good sense of smell also allows them to smell gas. It comes from moving deep underground and then trying to find its way out through small cracks in the surface. The first records of such animal behavior date back to ancient Greece. Cats, rats, snakes, and centipedes left their homes and fled to safety days before a major earthquake hit Greece. Some fish can predict the weather in the area. If sharks hang out near the shore, they're not necessarily looking for food. They may be hiding from a big storm at sea. The worst sign on the coastline is when all the water starts to go back abruptly. You can see the entire shoreline and even the fish and coral that are left on the land. Run away immediately, because soon a huge tsunami wave will come here and wash everything away. This is it! The end! You're packing up everything you can in whatever bags you have. Food, clothes, toiletries. The news in the background goes on, red alerts flashing all over the screen. You check your watch, and you know it's time. You haven't even finished packing yet. You rush out of your house and see everyone else lugging suitcases hurriedly. You get in your car and drive out as fast as you can, dodging all the people running around. You arrive at a secluded place in the woods. You've been working on your personal bunker for years. It's able to withstand the worst conditions. Tornadoes, hurricanes, volcanoes, and, hopefully, asteroids. You run to the bunker, hidden away next to some bushes and trees. There's no way anybody would know it's there. The door looks like the ones in bank vaults that contain huge piles of money. On the other side, a ladder that goes down 30 feet through a dark tunnel. The first thing you do is power up the place. It's all run on heavy-duty batteries, powered from solar panels above. As a backup, a fuel-powered generator. Hopefully you won't need to use it, but your life motto is, a person can't have too many fail-safes. The entire bunker is built from concrete and steel 
To maintain maximum durability, the walls are several feet thick. You can finally let out that sigh of relief because you made it just in time. You suddenly feel the ground vibrate, the walls tremble. Fear tightens in your chest when all the cabinet doors shake open and the stored food starts tumbling out. Did you miscalculate? Is this thing gonna hold up? The asteroid made contact, far from where you are, but it feels like it fell right on top of you. The sound is deafening and the shock waves seem to never end. The light flickers, the flying dust is hazing your vision and filling your lungs. You grab a mask with one final thought. This is it. The bunker's going to collapse. At least I tried. One month later. You're making breakfast after another sleepless night. Luckily, you stored more than enough food. And what variety? Canned tuna, corned beef, beans, sardines. Then there's the dried goods. Rice, powdered milk, pasta, noodles, and even some treats. Honey and chocolate. You also allowed yourself soda and juice, but water makes up most of your stored hydrators. This place has been, and will continue to be, your home for, who knows, weeks, months, years? The thought sends a chill down your spine. At least you're in an ideal location, far inland and away from any coast, so any possible tidal waves shouldn't have flooded your area. You can't imagine what it looks like up there. Please don't let it be like the dinosaurs part two. You need a distraction to take your thoughts away from the worst case scenario. You walk through your house like a real estate agent giving a tour to potential buyers. At the entrance, you have the living quarters, a couch and coffee table with some outdated magazines and board games. In front of you, a small flat screen TV with a DVD player. Sadly, no internet, but all those movies should keep you company. On a table nearby, you have a radio and telecommunications speaker that's like your ears and mouth to the outside. You also have your library with all sorts of books, classics, contemporary, and any genre, as long as it keeps your mind occupied. And if none of that helps you pass the time, there's always the video game consoles linked up to the TV. Ah yes, the gym area. It's modest, just a treadmill and some dumbbells. You try to get plenty of cardio and weightlifting in to keep yourself fit and healthy. Well, for someone living underground like a mole. Of course, you have the kitchen. It's got a good-sized mini fridge and a stainless steel sink with a bunch of cabinets storing all the goodies. You hook this place up with plumbing and pipes, bringing in clean drinking water. In case those stop working, you have water stored. The bathroom has a functioning toilet, sink, and a shower that's connected to the hot water pump. There's even a washer and dryer nearby. There's also a little workshop area. If something breaks, you can fix it here. You can also build some things out of scrap material, a chair or table if need be, a little figurine to put on the shelf and keep you company. Down some steps, you have another vital piece of the bunker, the greenhouse. It's all on lamps with artificial sunlight for obvious reasons. You'd be way worse off if you didn't have your fresh fruits and veggies. It's all self-sustaining too. Any rotten or bad crops go into making compost for the soil to keep it well nourished. You can forget about relying on meat for protein. Quinoa, beans, lentils, chickpeas, mushrooms, they get the job done. And just in case you're not getting every single mineral your body needs, you manage to stock up on multis. Vitamin D is a big one for life underground without the sun. Not far away from your little subterranean farm is your bedroom. It's got a queen-size bed, nightstand on the right, small wardrobe on the left. You don't have much variety in your attire, but Who's gonna notice if you wear the same outfit twice? The dust mites? You go down a ladder to find the generator room. There's a reason why it's further underground and sealed with soundproof material. The generator kicks in every now and then, and it's pretty noisy. It's also hooked up with the ventilation system, so the exhaust goes outside. Then there's the lung room. 
All these weird looking boxes are pumps that bring in oxygen from the outside world. But it has an advanced filtration system to clean the air before pumping it into your shelter. Down here is also the storage room. Every spare part of anything goes here. Extra couch, mattress, sinks. Even two freezers for those frozen goods, just in case. So, what's a day like in the bunker? First, whip up some breakfast and enjoy a cup of coffee. Then, you head over to the communication radio to hear if there's any news from the outside world. So far, there's been none. As soon as you're done, you head to the greenhouse for some quick farming. You really like being in there because it feels like you're outside enjoying nature. At least a little bit. You pick anything that's ripe and bring it into the kitchen for a wash. And wouldn't you know it, it's lunchtime. You prepare yourself a nice salad of cucumbers, tomatoes, and lettuce. Some beets on the side, pasta, and you eat it up. After lunch, you pop in a DVD you haven't watched in a while. After the movie, you go around and do a quick check on the oxygen levels in water. Today happens to be your scheduled generator checkup as well. You head down to the basement to glance at the fuel level and oxygen filters. All good so far. Though, the thought of an even more extended stay worries you. What if you run out of fuel? You spend a few hours in the workshop tinkering around. Currently, no fixer-upper projects, and you're not feeling especially creative today. So, you head to the gym. Today's leg day. Ugh, you dread it. Some things never change. Before you know it, it's time for dinner. You heat up some noodles and chill in the living room, listening to some tunes in the music player. This place cost you a little over $100,000, from digging up the site to construction and finally installing all the necessary systems needed for survival. And that's not including the extra food and personal activities for the bunker. Yes, you're lucky. All those luxuries make life good. Almost. Nothing new from the outside world after a whole month. You've always been a bit of an introvert, but this place is starting to push you a little. You're getting lonely. The sound of the radio snaps you out of your thoughts. Static? No, a muffled voice. Someone's trying to contact you. You bolt over to the communication radio, nearly tripping over your own feet from the shock. We made it! Ha! You're overcome with emotion! You've gotten pretty used to your life underground, but it's finally time to swing the door open and head out into the world. Something interesting has recently happened in South Dakota. It was all over the internet, so perhaps you already know about it. In July of 2022, the sky in this state suddenly turned green. So what happened there? Was it caused by a human or by nature? Let's find out. Tuesday, July 5th, 2022. Shortly after a heavy storm, the sky over South Dakota in the US was still overcast. Locals finally went outside and saw that the sky had an intense dark green hue, and they'd never seen anything like that before. People said that it looked like something straight up from science fiction or even a horror movie. Unsurprisingly, South Dakotans immediately started spreading the news all over social media. People shared their beautiful, yet very eerie, pictures on Twitter. They showed the sky over the city of Sioux Falls and a few other towns. Even though it may look like something supernatural, in reality, this is not a terrifying phenomenon at all. It's a simple play of the light and the atmosphere. Something like this happens quite rarely and usually means that really bad weather is approaching. And that's also true to what happened in South Dakota. Just before people started sharing photos, a thunderstorm swept through the town of Sioux Falls. This was confirmed by the US Weather Service. This hurricane was terrible. The wind speed was about 100 miles per hour. According to the Buford scale on wind speeds, this is the fastest and most destructive storm. There are only 12 numbers on this scale, and the maximum wind strength starts at 73 miles per hour. But why isn't this all over the news then? Well, because it's kind of a usual thing for the residents. 
Thunderstorms occur very often in the United States, especially in the warmer months. And one out of 10 such thunderstorms can become something serious, like a tornado. This one wasn't an exception. It was the so-called Derreco storm. Derreco is very widespread and long-lived. It's actually a combination of a fast-moving group of severe thunderstorms and downpours. People often say that a Derreco is as strong as a tornado. Still, there's a difference between them. A tornado is a vortex, a rotating column of air. It's usually about 500 feet in diameter, although sometimes its width can reach up to 2.5 miles. I don't envy those who would stumble upon that. But the main point is that they rotate. The wind moves very fast in a circle, near some invisible center. A derecho is a strong thunderstorm, or a system of strong thunderstorms with straight line winds. In other words, it doesn't spin. Instead, the derecho chooses a point somewhere and simply runs to it, like a very motivated marathon runner. If we compare a derecho to an ordinary tornado, the latter has six levels of strength, from 40 to 380 miles per hour. So a derecho is kind of like a small, average level one to two tornado. Usually, its speed is within the range of 73 to 113 miles per hour. And in both cases, they can be accompanied by severe thunderstorms, lightning, and rain. But still, these are different things. A storm becomes a derecho if the damage trail left by it exceeds 240 miles, and if the wind speed is at least 58 miles per hour. It's quite difficult to predict. It can form even on a clear day, when meteorologists don't even anticipate any storms. And then, the winds appear suddenly. It's so surprising that they may even feel explosive. But the National Weather Service tries to warn people at least half an hour or an hour before this happens, so that residents have time to prepare and hide. It wasn't any different this time. The storm swept through almost all of South Dakota, as well as the states of Minnesota and Iowa. The consequences were quite serious. More than 30,000 people were left without electricity. Fortunately, people were fine. That's because the locals are pretty used to derecos. However, the green sky is something different. It became a very unusual sight for the locals. Everyone was wondering why it happened. Was it a bad sign or a normal weather phenomenon? Well, to be honest, scientists don't have an exact explanation. But although there are only assumptions, they sound pretty convincing. A green sky is a very rare phenomenon. Most scientists think that this happens when a powerful storm approaches the area before sunset or sunrise. Then the sky will turn green in this area. NBC meteorologist Bill Cairns, who once faced a similar event himself, suggests that the green sky appeared because of the huge hail before the storm. First, let's talk about why the sky looks blue, or any other shade, depending on its mood. In short, the sun simultaneously carries all the rays of the color spectrum. It may seem white to us in total, but it actually has all the colors at the same time. However, these color waves all have different lengths. For example, blue rays are shorter than the other ones. They jump away from the air molecules better than the red waves, so they reach us faster. Because of this, on a regular clear day, the sky seems blue. At the same time, red and orange color waves are very long and move slower, so they're usually left behind. But when the sun goes below the horizon or rises, the rays' directions change, and these waves reach us better. It all means that even if the sunrises and sunsets seem red and orange to us, in fact, there are still blue and green waves among them. But they have to bounce off something to reach us faster and become stronger than the red rays. Have you guessed what I'm getting at? This is where the water comes into play. Clouds are made up of water droplets. When they become large enough, 
but don't fall yet. For example, due to strong winds, they affect how the light behaves in the sky. Large, heavy storms mostly consist of water and hail. And water reflects blue and green rays best of all. That's exactly the reason why the water in rivers and lakes seems bluish-green to us. Although in reality, it's transparent. And yeah, algae matter too. So, there are a couple of key factors why the sky may turn green. First off, the sun should be at the horizon level. Another factor is that while the storm clouds are approaching, they shouldn't cover the sky completely. There still must be a little room for the sun rays. Then, barely noticeable blue rays jump up to storm clouds. They're repelled by water droplets and hail. Mixing with the red sunset, they turn into a bright green light. And this green light is spreading all over the sky. That's why in most of these cases, when the sky turns green, people can only see it in the evenings. Yeah, it can also happen in the middle of the day. But since the conditions are already quite specific, seeing something like that during the day is even rarer. Still, if you see a green sky, you don't need to panic. It doesn't necessarily mean that a terrible storm is approaching. The chances are high though, but still, it's not a rule. It can be just heavy rain or a heavy hail. In other words, if you see a green sky, then you'd better hide and hide your car. However, if you were lucky enough to see the stunning sky from the comfort of your own home, it's indeed very exciting. If you get a glimpse of something like that, just know that you had a chance to experience something very rare and special. Some people said it was the most incredible thing they had ever seen. Ah, beautiful! You're walking with your friend and look up at the sky. The sun looks a bit different today, like it has some kind of ring around it, a rainbow type thing. Huh? Hey, look at that! Your friend pulls his head up out of his phone. You shouldn't look directly into the stop everything, he says. It's a sun halo. We need to find shelter now, unless you have the world's biggest umbrella on you. A sun's halo is nature's sign that there's a snow or rainstorm on its way. It's caused by clouds that are made of bazillions of small ice crystals flying around 20,000 feet. Sunlight goes through those crystals, which causes the light to split and refract, like when there's a rainbow. Now, don't look at the sun halo directly. It's going to be tempting because it's not something you see every day. Plus, it's really beautiful. But ultraviolet light can burn the exposed tissue of your retina and cause serious damage. So, not worth it. Grab some sunglasses, and you're good to go. This phenomenon lasts about 40 minutes. These clouds are the same ones that can cause a spooky ring around the moon at night sometimes. Nature sends early signs of disasters in many ways. J-shaped trees means there's a landslide coming. Since the ground is moving slowly, the trees grow into the super selfieable shape. Try to find a flat area and avoid going near any trees, unless you have superhuman strength. You're on a nice walk on the beach. Sand, sun, not a cloud in the sky. Then, out of nowhere, you see the ocean going back away from the shore. Suddenly, you can even see bits of coral, small fish, and other random small sea animals. That's a good sign to leave. There might be a tsunami on the way. A tsunami is formed when there's an earthquake underwater, and it can hit the coast at 500 miles per hour. It's mostly a Pacific Ocean thing, but why risk it? If there's a channel of choppy water on the beach, stay away. There might be a rip current under the surface that can be extremely dangerous. Sometimes, waves hit the shore in a weird way, which forms these rip currents. You might see a strange gap in the waves. Or you might notice random bits of seaweed going in all different directions. If you don't ever find yourself caught in a rip current, try to stay afloat and don't waste your energy swimming against the current. Yell out for help and try to float your way along the beach. Once you break out of the channel, swim diagonally to the shore. If you find yourself in the ocean and see a group of sharks swimming, okay, this scenario doesn't sound good either way. Well, the good news is they're not necessarily coming for you. The bad news? The sharks might be trying to escape from a huge tropical storm or even a hurricane. 
Sharks can sense these things. So when nature gets angry, they group together and swim deep under the surface to get to safety. You probably shouldn't follow them. Good luck! The golden rule since ancient times, follow the animals. Insects, rats, and snakes leave their homes a couple of days before really big earthquakes. Scientists can't track or really explain how they know it's coming. It seems animals really can sense earthquakes. Maybe because they feel those smaller initial shock waves that we don't even notice. What if you see animals running towards you? Well, that could mean you're about to get eaten for breakfast. Or it means there's a wildfire behind them. Amphibians like frogs, toads, and salamanders try to protect themselves by burrowing down into the ground. Others just run. Before you start running alongside them, check to see if you can see smoke. You don't want to sprint flat out for nothing. Well, it's not just animals. We can spot warning signs, too. For example, if you notice your hair suddenly starts to stand on end and your jewelry starts to buzz, take shelter right away. Lightning might be about to strike somewhere nearby. If you're outside and can't run into a house, make sure not to stand near any tall structures. Lie flat on the ground. Be near water. Seek shelter under an isolated tree or stand in an open space. And don't stand on top of the Empire State Building. That thing gets zapped hundreds of times a year. Do you like skiing? It's all fun and games until all you can see is white. Avalanches can move up to 80 miles an hour. So watch for some warning signs. Does it feel hollow when you walk in the snow? Are there cracks around your feet? Can you see a huge avalanche coming? Time to go! Sometimes a storm mixes its blue light with the red light from the sun, and you get a pretty impressive green. Enjoy it from a safe distance, preferably indoors. This super tall thundercloud usually means you're about to get smashed by hail, or worse, a tornado. Find cover somewhere, like in an underground parking lot or a basement. It might be a bit embarrassing if you're wrong, though. Okay, we know volcanoes can be dangerous. But the lakes near them? Is anything not a sign of danger? Lakes that are near something boiling hot that never cools, so volcanoes, are like wildly shaken soda cans just about to burst. The magma that's underground actually pushes carbon dioxide into the bottom of the lake, and that gas stays there, waiting. Then, even something boring like rain can disturb the lake a little too much and bam! Or boom! (laughs) You get the picture. Diving, swimming, snorkeling, the sea can be amazing, but it's pretty unpredictable. When two wave currents run into each other, they can create a cross sea. It looks pretty cool from far away, but it can be really dangerous for swimmers, surfers, or even ships. There's a strong current roaming around under the surface. You're walking on the beach, apparently every good story starts like this, and all of a sudden, woo, a cave! How cool is this? You should probably go in there, explore a bit, and no. If there's a full moon out, you might not be able to get out of that cave. A full moon affects the tide and makes it lower than usual. That cave might be more accessible, but instead of an exciting adventure, you could end up trapped in there until the next full moon. Bring a big lunch. A wall cloud is one of those things you're both excited and scared to see. Scared because you don't know what it is. Excited because, well, how often do you see something like that? Whatever you feel, tell your legs to start running. During a thunderstorm, these wall clouds sit lower than anything else and can be up to 5 miles long. And if they start spinning, well, Dorothy ended up in Oz. Who knows where you'll end up? It's 2009 in Italy. A man was hanging out in his kitchen. Then he saw some flickering lights. He knew just what to do. He moved his family to a safe place. A couple of seconds later, a massive earthquake hit the whole region. His family survived thanks to his quick reaction. He knew these flickering lights were actually a sign of an upcoming earthquake. People have been seeing these mysterious lights for ages. Some thought it was some kind of sign coming from space. Scientists never used to take them seriously. But after the invention of photography, more and more evidence of these strange lights appeared. Soon, they realized the connection. The lights appear, and pretty soon, the earthquake hits. 
After a bit of digging around, they actually found some records of these earthquake lights from hundreds of years ago. There were bluish flames coming out of the ground right before an earthquake. Ooh, creepy. Oh, ocean, come on, not you again. Okay, but just one more. If you see the oceans turned all reddish-brown, don't go in the water or anywhere near it. This red tide is caused by toxic algae and is something you can find all over the world. That toxic algae can be there even if the ocean's a normal color. Getting that stuff all over you can cause some health issues. Rinse yourself off in fresh water as fast as you can. You know, they even wrote a holiday song about it. Algae home for Christmas. No, really. Look at this ominous dark cloud. Is it rotating? What on earth is happening here? What you see is called a supercell. It's a storm, often a thunderstorm, that contains an updraft rotating about a vertical axis. That's why they're also called rotating thunderstorms. There are actually four types of thunderstorms. Single cell, multi-cell, squall line, and supercell. Out of them all, supercells are the rarest and the most severe. They're typically isolated from other thunderstorms and last for two to four hours. Supercells are very common for the Great Plains of the United States. In particular, the area known as Tornado Alley. But they can occur in other parts of the world too. For example, in Europe, Argentina, Uruguay, and southern Brazil. These storms can be any size, large and small, high or low topped. Supercells are also associated with the most severe tornadoes, even though not every supercell can create one. These storms usually produce great amounts of torrential rainfall and hail, and are accompanied by powerful winds and downbursts. Downbursts are powerful winds that come down from a thunderstorm. Once they hit the ground, they spread out very quickly. These winds are dangerous, since they can cause a lot of damage. Even though they're often confused with tornadoes, downbursts are a totally different phenomenon. Let's have a look at how a downburst forms. At the beginning of a thunderstorm, there's a powerful updraft. That's why the cloud grows vertically and hailstones and raindrops start forming inside. The storm matures and the updraft keeps feeding the cloud with unstable moist air. Hailstones and raindrops are now big and heavy enough to fall to the ground. But sometimes, the updraft is so strong that it suspends huge amounts of hail and rain in the upper part and the center of the storm. But let's say some dry air gets into the middle and lower parts of the storm. It can cause a downburst. When it happens, all that amount of rain and hail from the upper part of the storm dashes toward the ground, dragging along a lot of air. All this mass gains speed. And when the downburst eventually reaches the ground, it's like a stream of water coming out of a faucet and hitting the sink. It spreads in all directions at an incredible speed, sometimes more than 100 miles per hour. But what you might most likely come across is called a microburst. It means that those terrible winds are confined to an area smaller than 2.5 miles across. While speaking about tornadoes, I can't but mention volcanic tornadoes. They're possibly one of the scariest natural phenomena. When a volcano erupts, it throws hot rock and ash high into the atmosphere. As for lava pieces and hot gases, they travel down the volcano's slope. When this flow is moving down, some of the gases trapped inside begin to rise and spin at the same time. They get squeezed by the surrounding air, which makes them spin faster and faster. That's how a volcanic tornado gets born. On the bright side, this phenomenon has a very short lifespan. If you ever see a tight burning column of air, that's a fire tornado, a creepy combination of whirlwind sounds and scorching inferno. This phenomenon is also called a fire twister or fire whirl. This dangerous natural phenomenon mostly occurs during wildfires. While burning, such fires create a big area of boiling hot air just above the ground. And when this scorching air gets mixed with the cooler air higher up, it results in a whirlwind that churns up burning debris and flames. 
the most powerful fire nados can stretch hundreds of feet into the sky. Another dangerous natural phenomenon is called a snow squall. If you get caught in a snow squall while driving, you won't find a safe place on a highway because this is an intense, but thankfully pretty short, period of heavy snowfall that comes along with powerful gusty winds and sometimes even lightning. People have known about this phenomenon for quite some time, but the term itself, as well as the warning associated with this danger, appeared only in 2018. Another danger of snow squalls is something called a flash freeze. Come to think of it, it makes sense. Rapidly dropping temperatures and freshly fallen snow glaze highways very fast. This makes controlling your car almost impossible. The next curious phenomenon I'm going to talk about happens extremely rarely and is still poorly understood. It's usually not something big and turbulent. Dust devils can be tiny and vanish within minutes. They've got lots of names, whirlwinds, dusters, and sand spouts. Dust devils look like funnels of sand spiraling upward from the ground. But unlike their terrifying relatives, tornadoes, these babies are normally nothing to worry about. And still, according to the definition, dust devils fall in the same category as hurricanes and tornadoes. All three natural phenomena feature a column of air kind of spinning around an invisible pole. They're all formed during the collision of different types of air, moist versus dry, or hot versus cold, and so on. But hurricanes usually form over a body of water where cold air slides under warm air. Tornadoes spiral down from the sky when hot air rises through a mass of cold air, and dust devils form on the ground. Even though we call them dust devils, they can actually swirl any loose debris. The main criteria, the pieces have to be small and light enough to be lifted by a fast-moving vortex. By the way, do you know that some clouds can predict extreme weather? For example, shelf clouds. They look like something from a sci-fi movie. They form when warm and moist air gets caught in a thunderstorm updraft. These ominous clouds most often mean a storm is coming. Those huge white lumps over your head are called mammatus clouds. They can make you believe the sky is falling. Most clouds form when air rises into the atmosphere, but mammatus clouds appear when moist and cool air goes down and mixes with dry air. The result is these unique puffed rice clouds. By the way, if you see this phenomenon in the sky, bad weather is just around the corner. Morning glory clouds are extremely rare and harmless. They look like massive tubes stretching across the sky. They can snake for more than 600 miles, sitting relatively low. Most researchers agree that these clouds appear when an updraft squeezes through the cloud. This creates the signature rolling appearance. The cool air at the back of the cloud makes it sink downward. The best, but not the only, place to see the morning glory is Australia's Gulf of Carpentaria. If you decide to travel there to see these clouds, choose a period from late September to early November. Ever seen huge round disks in the sky? Most likely, those were lenticular clouds. They usually form over large and high places, like mountains or hills. When strong wind bumps into some barrier, this creates an air wave. The air kind of wraps around the obstacle. And the higher the barrier is, the colder the air that is rising over it becomes. At some point, the moisture it contains turns into water droplets. And they form these unusual clouds. Lenticular clouds can look like waves, a pizza, or even a stack of pancakes. And these clouds, on the contrary, form low in the sky and after some bad weather. Rainbow clouds appear on top of puffy low-altitude clouds after thunderstorms. They usually hover at the height of around 6,000 feet. When the water vapor they contain condenses, the resulting droplets act like prisms. This forms multicolored caps over the clouds. And a pretty scary bonus fact for you. One of the most common causes of wildfires is lightning from thunderstorms. But have you ever heard of a wildfire that triggered a thunderstorm? Well, now you know. It happened on May 11, 2018, 
not far from Amarillo, Texas. Then, the super-powerful Mallard Fire not only created a massive dense cloud high in the air, but its heat also caused a violent thunderstorm that later dumped tons of quarter-sized hailstones 60 miles away in Wheeler County, Texas. <laughs> 